Hi, welcome to the video about pick a picks. This is a tutorial to teach anybody who has never done a pick a picks before how to do one. So, how do you solve a pick a picks puzzle? Well, the first thing to know is that you really need to start on the easiest level. We're going to be starting on something called ultra easy because there's lots of different levels to these puzzles, as you'll see. It's also really important to know the rules. So, that's what this video is going to. Um, basically talk about and go a little bit beyond that with some strategy. I would suggest using a pencil because as a beginner, you're prone to make mistakes, which is great. That's how you learn, but you want to be able to um, erase those mistakes and start again. And the other really big piece of advice is that you shouldn't take guesses on these puzzles. You only want to mark things down that you're absolutely sure of, because if you take a guess and you're wrong, you might lose a lot of time on the work that you've done. All right, so there are black and white pick a picks puzzles and there are color pick a picks puzzles. So I'm only gonna talk about the black and white puzzles. When you see a pick a picks puzzle, it's gonna look like a grid, right? Lots of squares. Your job is to fill in or paint the blocks so that you will eventually reveal a picture. This is actually one of the pick a picks puzzles that I'm going to walk us through at the end of the video. So notice we start with a blank grid. We follow these rules, right? We use some strategies and eventually we're going to get this pirate ship picture. Notice that at the left, there are a bunch of numbers and at the top, there are a bunch of numbers. And that's because we're going to use these numbers to figure out how many cells we are going to fill in and how many cells we are not going to fill in. We're going to call those spaces. We move from left to right and from up to down. We're going to use two symbols in these puzzles. When we know that something isn't filled in, we're going to put a little dot there. We're going to call that a space. And when something is filled in, we're going to fill it in completely. And we're going to either call that a fill or a block. So it's good to know this vocabulary as I go forward. When it comes to rows, we're going to have these numbers ordered from left to right. So when I see three, four, that means I'm going to have a block of three all together. I'm going to have some type of space, at least one space. There could be more if there's room. And then I'm going to have a block of four all together. This is just one possible way that the three and the four could show up. Now, there weren't any other clues right now, so I don't know if this is right or wrong. This is just an example to show you how things go in order from left to right. Columns, same idea, except we're gonna go from top to bottom. So three, three, one means we're gonna have a block of three, some type of space, right, at least one space. Then we'll have another block of three, again, some space to separate it from the block of one. Now this one, notice if I add all of, all of those um, squares up, right? We have four here on the top, another four here and one. That makes up nine in this column of 10. So that looks like we know everything except one of these cells, right? So one of these cells must also be another blank somewhere. But I wouldn't necessarily know where to put it. That would be taking a guess, right? So when I fill this in right now, I'm just showing you one possible example of what a 331 column could look like, right? I wouldn't know this just from looking at this row. Okay, so let's talk about some strategy. Sometimes it's really good to start out with single numbers, rows that have just one number in them, especially if they are really big numbers or high numbers for the size puzzle that you're doing. Sometimes they can give you the entire line filled up. Sometimes they'll just give you a part of it as well. So let me break that down for you. This is what I would call a complete fill. Let's say we were given a row and it had 15 boxes and the number was 15. Well, that would mean, right, all 15 of those boxes would have to be filled in. So complete fills are very easy to figure out. There's nothing much to really do with them. You just have to recognize that they're there. Now, partial fills, they're a little bit harder to understand. So let's take that same row of 15 and change the number from a 15 to a 10. This tells us that 10 boxes, right, 10 cells, must be filled in all next to each other. 
I'm going to use something called the overlap method first to show you that we know how to fill in parts of this row. That's why it's called a partial fill. I'm going to find the overlap of all the possibilities. I don't actually write these down, but I'm putting these out here on the screen so you can kind of see what's going on in my head. Here's one option for the 10. I'm going to call this the left extreme case. Notice that it starts right at the first cell and it goes 10 to the right from there, right? The next case would be to skip one, start on the second cell, shade in 10, right? Third cell, shade in 10, and so on, right? These are all of the possibilities. That last one, I would say, is another extreme case. Notice that it's as far out as that can go, right? We skipped five boxes, five cells, and that left 10 cells left, right? There's no way I could push that any farther to the right. So where do these things overlap? Notice that all of the options have those middle five boxes filled in. Okay, notice that I could have figured that out if I had just looked at the extreme cases. So when I'm actually doing puzzles, especially when I do harder puzzles, I'm really only considering the extreme cases in my mind. Where do the extreme cases overlap? Well, in this case, those middle five would mean that the middle five of that row would have to be filled in. So we got a partial fill out of this method, right? Not bad, we didn't get the whole 10, but we got some of it. That's one method. Let me give you another method. Some people like this method better. It's called the subtraction method. You're going to take the length of the row and subtract the length of the block. That's gonna tell you how many uncertain cells, or basically in this case, blank for now, right? There are at the end of each of the rows. So in this situation, we would have had a 15 for the row length, 10 for the block, and when we subtract those, we get five. So notice that there are five blank at the end of each of the, there are five of the blank cells, right, at each end of this row. So two different methods, but they really do get you the same result. So I use this method a lot. This is the method that we're gonna use with the other strategies as well. It all comes back to this one. Right now though, I would like you to take a moment, if you have the packet that goes along with this, right, and you were able to print it out, you can do the test yourself right now. And if you don't have the paper, you can just look at the screen, try to count it out, fill it in, and see what you think would get a partial fill. All right, so pause that video right now. All right, so now that you've given this a try, let's see how you did. Moving on, when we have two or more numbers in a row, there are some strategies that we can use. Sometimes we can get a complete fill out of them, just like we did before. So let's go through some of those examples. When might that happen? When you add up those numbers together, but you also include the minimum number of spaces you must have between those numbers, sometimes you get the same number that's the width of the puzzle. And that means you can complete the row. So here's an example, 10, two, and one. Well, 10 with a one in between, right? Cause we need that at least one space, plus two, plus another one space in between. And then a one happens to add up to 15. So that means we know exactly how this row must be filled in. 10 space, two space, one because there's no other room for another possibility. Here's another one, 10 and four. Well, if we do 10 plus one for the space in between the 10 and the four, add the four on there, we get 15. So that must be 10 space four. And here's one more, one, eight, two, one. Now we're gonna have more spaces, right? So we should have a space between the one and the eight, a space between the eight and the two, a space between the two and the one and we get 15. So that must be a complete fill as well. So that doesn't always happen though. Let's talk about some partial fills when there's more than one number. The first thing that you wanna do is block off some cells for the smaller blocks. 
Then you want to take what's left over in that row and see if you can figure out what goes in there. So here's an example, 2 and 10. If I block off two of the first spaces, right, because we know the two has to happen first. Now, it doesn't necessarily go right there, but we're saying that's the earliest place that it could go. That two would also then need a space before the 10 appears. That leaves us with these 12 open blocks. We know that the 10 has to fit within there. So I'm going to go through my overlap method, and I'm going to figure out that those middle eight blocks are in all of the possibilities. You could also do the subtraction method here. 12 empty spaces, 10 have to be filled in, subtract that, and you get two blanks on each end. You could do this with many numbers, so 5, 3, 3. You can even start the blocking off at the end. If you know that this last or the second of the threes has to be the last block that shows up. Let's put it all the way at the uh, one extreme, right, where it could be. It would have to have a space before it. Now let's put that middle three in there and a space before that. That leaves a open space of seven cells. If we need to fit a five in there, that would mean that there would need to be two blank on each end. Notice that I started with the five. I always start with the bigger number. It's more likely to get some overlap. Notice if I move these X's out of the way, right? But I, just for the, the middle three, but I leave on the, the X's for the last three. Now I have one, two, three, four, five, six open in the middle, right? Actually, there should be a space between the five and the three. So let's remove one of those spots, and that's really now five. And if I do five minus three, I get, I get a difference of two. So I leave two blank on each end there. And now lastly, take away the, the blocks of the last three, put in a space after that middle single block there, we have another five, and we can do that overlap or the subtraction method, and we have another filled in partial there. So you can see we're starting to make these a little bit harder, right? But you're able to get part of the puzzle. And once we get parts of the puzzle and we look at them as a whole, we can start to see more and more of these, these tricks. All right, so it's time to do a little test for yourself. So if you have your paper, go ahead, give these a try. If not, just pause the video and see if you can do these I wouldn't recommend doing these particular problems in your head, maybe jotting them down on a piece of paper and trying to figure them out. All right, and now for the answers. Okay, moving on to our next strategy, which is gonna be segments. Segments are when we take rows and we get them split into like little mini rows, we call them segments. And sometimes this can show us which block belongs in which segment. So here we go. We have a row of 15, but we have a definite space in there, which means that that 15 has now been split up into a segment of three and a segment of 11. Well, if our numbers are two and 10, we have to realize that the two has to go in the three segment and the 10 has to go in the 11 segment. There's no way that I'm going to fit the 10 in the three segment, right? So it's kind of like a common sense part to this. If I treat them like little mini rows, so now if I do a little mini row of three minus two, right, that difference is one, there would be a space of one at the end of each of those. And the same idea with the 10, 11 minus 10 is one, so we get one on the ends of each of those. So those segments can be very helpful. So let's do another one. This time we have a row of, what is this, 20, but we have two definite spaces. So that means it is broken down into three segments. Hmm, but we have four numbers here. Well, let's count this one out. Three, space, four, space, Ooh, see how I couldn't fit the two here? Let's, let's try the two in here. Two, 
mm, I, I'd have to have a space. And then four would have to go in here. So look at that. We know that this last segment of five must be the four, right? So that's either using the overlap of the subtractive or the subtraction method right there. I also think that this segment is the only place where I can fit the two. Let me just count that out again. Three, space, four, space. Yeah, there's no, there's not enough room here for the two. So right in here, we're, we're gonna know that that middle one must be filled in because that must be this two. Let's work on the three and the four now. What if I block off three and then one for a space? If I do the three here, we have one, two, three, four, five, six left to fit this four. So that means we'd have two on each end still open. All right, now let's put in a space right here. Here is our open space for the three. So that means only the middle one would be filled in. All right, so we were able to see just from these two dots exactly where each of these blocks would be. Okay, it is time for you to now test out that strategy. Notice that I've also included one on the bottom there that doesn't have any um, uh, definite spaces in it, just to, to practice some of our, our old strategies as well. All right, give those a try. And now for some answers. All right, now for our last strategy, um, we would like to be able to extend when we know definite fills and spaces. So do fills lead to more fills and do spaces lead to more spaces? And can I combine those two ideas? So that is true that sometimes fills can lead to more definite fills. So back to our row of 15, we know that this block has to have 10 in it and we already know that two of these things are definitely filled in. Well, just by looking at this, I know that I'm gonna have to fill in more this way, right? There's not enough spaces to the left to make 10. So let's count this out. I already have two and I have room for two more here. So it could still be that these are filled in. So let's start from here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. I know that these six spaces right here have to be filled in. Otherwise it wouldn't fit. Now notice how we have eight of these 10 already filled in. So sometimes definite fills can also tell us where we have definite spaces. So for instance, I know that this box down here is not gonna get filled in. There's no way it could be. It would make this way too long, right? So I know this must be a space. This must be a space. I even know that this must be a space because if this is eight, the most it could take up is two additional spaces. So those last three must be those dots. Sometimes we only have one number in a row, but it looks like we have two separate blocks that are being started, like this one, right? In this situation, we know that these must be connected, right? Since there's only one number in here. So that would be the first thing that I do is to connect them. And then I'm gonna take a count. Let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Great, we have eight. We have eight of the 10. That means, just like above, we can only go two to the right or two to the left, which means we have some definite spaces right here and right here. Let's do one more example. A two and a six. The row is 15. It looks like we already have the two. The two has been completed. That means that this must be part of the six. So it only has room to go three to the left. Let's give it room to go three to the right. There we go, All right? That would make a, a total of six now. We also know that it's not gonna go out this far. We know that those last two must be blank. So hopefully all of these strategies together are gonna help you do a complete puzzle. One more test before we get to that puzzle though. Give these a try. All right, and for our last set of answers, here you go. If you happen to have any questions, 
about these answers. Like maybe you're not sure why they're the right answers or how you got something different, why what you have isn't right. You could always take a picture and email me or if we're in class, obviously ask me in class. All right, and now on to our first real puzzle. Like I said, we're gonna start on ultra easy. I like to use this website called Conceptus Puzzles. Some of them are free, some of them you have to pay for. This is one of the free ones. And what's nice about doing them on a computer is that it's easy to erase if um, you make mistakes. I, I actually do suggest using paper first. I think it might be easier so you're not playing around with the controls, like you're, you're worrying about the actual puzzle instead of how to do the puzzle. Um, but let's use some of these strategies right now. Um, our first strategy was single numbers, right? Notice that this row is 10. The other thing nice about this computer uh, puzzle is that it tells you how long things are, right? Otherwise you have to count them out. I will tell you though that when you print them out, the boxes that are um, made up of fives have these bold lines around them and that makes it very um, helpful. Okay, anyway, back to this nine. Um, let's see, it's 10 minus nine would be one. So we would have one empty at each end there. So that would be a partial fill. Uh, seven, we could work with the seven, right? Because 10 minus seven is three. So I'll leave three empty there. Okay, um, another strategy was to add up the numbers in a column or a row along with the spaces, the minimum number of spaces, and to see if you get the width. So I think that actually happens here. If we do seven plus one plus two, we get 10. Perfect, so that means it must be seven space two. Great. The computer also puts a little green arrow here if you get it right. All right. What else could we do? Uh, I'm going to point out a few things that I didn't mention in the strategies just because they're kind of little. I forgot to do it too. Um, look at this first row. It's one, one, and I already have a, a filled in here. I'm just going to put some dots around it because I know it's complete, right? I, I know it can't be anything else. I'm not sure which of these ones it is, but I know it must be a one. Um, seven, two, look at that. Sometimes these columns and rows repeat. So I've already done that one. I'm just gonna copy what I did there. And look at that. That means I have the other one up here. And once I have both of these ones, I know that the rest of these must be dots. All right, so we are well on our way here. We've completed three rows and columns. Uh, I think we're gonna do a little repeat here, right? This is gonna be a one and a one. So these are all dots. And the same for this one. All right. Next up, um, I'm looking at these rows that have multiple numbers. I feel like three numbers in a puzzle that's only 10 long is a lot. Um, so we got three, three, two. It actually looks like that's already been blocked off for us, right? Look at this segment, three and another three segment and another two segment. This is the only place that the three, three, two can go. I think we have the same thing happening with this two, two, three, right? Two, two, three. And that's the only way we could do those. Here it is again, two, two, the three is already done. And another one, two, two, three. Okay, this one's moving pretty quickly here. I'm gonna put some dots around this three because it looks like we are only allowed to have threes in this row here and here. Um, let's see, what could I do next? Um, I could put a dot right here because this column's only allowed to have twos. Ooh, and look what this dot lets us do. It now blocked this, this row off into two segments, right? I know the seven's not gonna go in that space, so I closed it off. And then one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, that must be finished as well. This dot also shows me a lot about this row, right? I could fill this in, that must be the two. And I'll close these off with dots. All right, um, our nine looks like it's already been completed by doing that. So I'll put a dot there for finishing that. The first column is a one. I already have a one, so we'll put dots there. 
That leaves us with our three, three, and our three, four rows. Taking a look at this row here, this must be the three, this must be the four. Obviously they're not finished yet, right? Now the three, I have some options, right? I could go here or here. But if I went here, that wouldn't give me enough room to have a space and then a four. So I believe the three has to go here. Then we have to have a space and then we have to have a four. So I'm gonna repeat that right here. Um, by doing that, I think we closed off this whole column, this two, three, to only leave a space for the twos. And look at that. We have finished and we got the ship that we started with at the beginning of the video. So I'm gonna give you a packet that starts off with ultra easies. Most of them are 10 by 10 or um, like 10 by 15 or 15 by 15. The bigger they get, the harder they get. And if you really like doing these, they eventually, they, they are huge. They can be really huge. Um, and this website that I'm using, you can pay for those puzzles. Um, you, if you're really interested in them though, um, I have access to the website, just ask me. I can take a little snippet and send you harder ones, but I think the packet will keep you busy for a while. So I hope that you guys like doing these. I like doing these. Uh, and again, if you have any questions, just email me. Good luck, everybody.